Welcome to Natu Reads, an audio library of revolutionary texts. Interview with Chairman Gonzalo. Conducted by El Diario. Part 1. Objectives. El Diario. Chairman Gonzalo, what prompted you, after a lengthy silence, to do this interview? And why did you choose El Diario? Chairman Gonzalo. Let us start by saying that the Communist Party of Peru, Partido Comunista del Perú, PCP, which has been leading the People's War for more than eight years now, has expressed itself publicly in a number of different documents. We have always considered the pronouncements of the party itself to be much more important, because that way it is crystal clear that it is the PCP that has dared to initiate the People's War, lead it, and carry it forward. The reason we are taking this occasion to speak in a personal interview like this one, which is the first time we have had the pleasure to do so, and specifically with you, has to do with the Party Congress. Our party has accomplished a long-awaited historic task with the convening of its Congress. For decades, we struggled hard to bring this about, but it's only the People's War that has given us the conditions to actually accomplish it. That's why we say that the First Congress is the offspring of two great parents, the Party and the People's War. As the official documents state, this Congress marks a milestone, a victory, in which our Party has been able to sum up the long road traveled, and has established the three basic elements of party unity. Its ideology, which is Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, Gonzalo thought, the program, and the general political line. Furthermore, this Congress has established a solid basis for advancing towards the prospective seizure of power. The Congress, then, is a great victory, and it is one of the main reasons for giving this interview. Other reasons have to do with the profound crisis that our country is going through, and the ever-growing and more powerful development of the class struggle of the masses, and with the international situation and how revolution is the main trend in the world. As to why we are doing this interview with El Diario, there is a very simple reason. El Diario is a trench of combat, and today it is the only tribune that really serves the people. We believe that though it would have been possible to be interviewed by others, including foreigners, it is better, and more in accord with our principles, to be interviewed by a paper like El Diario, which is really struggling every day, under difficult conditions, to serve the people and the revolution. That is the reason. El Diario Chairman Gonzalo, have you weighed the possible implications of conducting this interview? Let me ask you. Don't you run some risk talking publicly at this time? Chairman Gonzalo Being communists, we fear nothing. Moreover, our party has steeled us to challenge death itself, and to carry our life on our fingertips, so that we may give it whenever the revolution demands it. We believe that this interview has overriding importance. It serves our party, serves the revolution, serves our people and our class, and also why not say it, serves the international proletariat, the peoples of the world, the world revolution. Whatever risk, then, is nothing, especially, I repeat, steeled as we are by the party. 1. Ideological Questions El Diario Chairman, let's talk about one of the ideological foundations of the PCP. Maoism. Why do you consider Maoism the third stage of Marxism? Chairman Gonzalo. This point is crucial and of enormous consequence. For us, Marxism is a process of development, and this great process has given us a new, third, and higher stage. Why do we say that we are in a new, third, and higher stage, Maoism? We say this because, in examining the three component parts of Marxism, 
it is clearly evident that Chairman Mao Zedong has developed each one of these three parts. Let's enumerate them. In Marxist philosophy, no one can deny his great contribution to the development of dialectics, focusing on the law of contradiction, establishing that it is the only fundamental law. On political economy, it will suffice to highlight two things. The first, of immediate and concrete importance for us, is bureaucrat capitalism, and second, the development of the political economy of socialism, since in synthesis, we can say that it is Mao who really established and developed the political economy of socialism. With regard to scientific socialism, it is enough to point to people's war, since it is with Chairman Mao Zedong that the international proletariat has attained a fully developed military theory, giving us then the military theory of our class, the proletariat, applicable everywhere. We believe that these three questions demonstrate a development of universal character. Looked at in this way, what we have is a new stage. And we call it the third one, because Marxism has two preceding stages, that of Marx and that of Lenin, which is why we speak of Marxism-Leninism. A higher stage, because with Maoism, the ideology of the worldwide proletariat attains its highest development up to now, its loftiest peak but with the understanding that Marxism is, if you'll excuse the reiteration, a dialectical unity that develops through great leaps, and that these great leaps are what give rise to stages. So, for us, what exists in the world today is Marxism-Leninism-Maoism, and principally Maoism. We think that to be Marxist today, to be communists, necessarily demands that we be Marxist-Leninist-Maoists, and principally Maoists. Otherwise, we couldn't be genuine communists. I would like to emphasize a situation that is rarely taken into account, and definitely deserves to be studied closely today. I am referring to Mao Zedong's development of Lenin's great thesis on imperialism. This is of great importance today, and in the historical stage that is presently unfolding. Again, simply listing his contributions, we could point out the following. He discovered a law of imperialism when he said that imperialism makes trouble and fails, makes trouble again and fails again until its final doom. He also specified a period in the process of development of imperialism, which he called, quote, the next 50 to 100 years, end quote. Years, as he said, unparalleled on earth, during which, as we understand it, we will sweep imperialism and reaction from the face of the earth. He also pointed to something that today, more than ever, can't be ignored. He said that, quote, a period of struggle between U.S. imperialism and Soviet social imperialism has begun, end quote. In addition, we all know of his great strategic thesis that, quote, imperialism and all reactionaries are paper tigers, end quote. This is a thesis of enormous importance, and we must keep in mind that Chairman Mao applied this thesis to U.S. imperialism and Soviet social imperialism, both of which we have no reason to be afraid of. But also, we must keep in mind how he saw the development of war, following exactly what Lenin had stated about the era of wars that had opened up in the world. The chairman has taught us that a country, a nation, a people, no matter how small, can defeat the most powerful exploiter and dominator on earth if they dare to take up arms. Moreover, he has taught us how to understand the process of war and how never to fall for nuclear blackmail. I believe that these are some questions that we must keep in mind in order to understand how Chairman Mao Zedong developed Lenin's great thesis on imperialism. And why do I insist on this? Because we understand that just as Lenin's contributions are based on the great work of Marx, Chairman Mao Zedong's developments are based on the great work of Marx and Lenin on Marxism-Leninism we would never be able to understand Maoism without understanding Marxism-Leninism. We believe that these things are of great importance today. And for us, it has been decisive to understand Maoism in theory and practice as a third, new, and higher stage. El Diario Chairman Gonzalo, do you believe that if José Carlos Mariátegui were alive, he would uphold the theories and contributions of Chairman Mao? 
Chairman Gonzalo. In synthesis, Mariategui was a Marxist-Leninist. Beyond that, in Mariategui, the founder of the party, we find theses similar to those that Chairman Mao has made universal. Thus, as I see it, today Mariategui would be a Marxist-Leninist Maoist. This is not speculation. It is simply the product of understanding the life and work of José Carlos Mariategui. El Diario Moving on to another question. What is the ideology of the proletariat, and what role does it play in the social processes of the world today? What do the classics, Marx, Lenin, and Mao, mean to the PCP? Chairman Gonzalo Today, tomorrow, and in these stormy decades in which we live, we can see the, enor- we can see the enormous and overriding importance that proletarian, that proletarian ideology has. First, Although I'm emphasizing something that is well known, it is the theory and practice of the final class in history. The ideology of the proletariat is the product of the struggle of the international proletariat. It also comprehends the study and understanding of the whole historical process of class struggle that went on before the proletariat, of the struggle of the peasantry in particular, the great heroic struggles they have waged. It represents the highest level of study and understanding that science has produced. In sum, the ideology of the proletariat, the great creation of Marx, is the highest world outlook that has ever been or ever will be seen on Earth. It is the world outlook, the scientific ideology, that for the first time provided mankind, our class principally, and the people, with a theoretical and practical instrument for transforming the world and we have seen how everything that he predicted has come about. Marxism has been developing. It has become Marxism-Leninism, and today, Marxism-Leninism-Maoism. And we see how this ideology is the only one capable of transforming the world, making revolution, and leading us to the inevitable goal of communism. It is of enormous importance. I would like to emphasize something. It is ideology, but it is scientific. Nevertheless, we must understand very well that we cannot make any concessions to the stand of the bourgeoisie, which wants to reduce the ideology of the proletariat to a simple method. To do so is to debase and to deny it. Please excuse my insistence, but as Chairman Mao said, quote, it isn't enough to say it once, but a hundred times. It isn't enough to say it to a few, but to many. End quote. Basing myself on this, I say that the ideology of the proletariat, Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, and today, principally Maoism, is the only all powerful ideology, because it is true, and historical facts are showing that. It is the product, aside from what has already been said, of the extraordinary work of extraordinary historical figures like Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, and Chairman Mao Zedong to point out the most outstanding. But among them, we give special emphasis to three, Marx, Lenin, and Chairman Mao Zedong, as the three banners that are embodied, once again, in Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, and principally Maoism. And what, precisely, is our task today? It is to raise up the banner of our ideology, defend and apply it, and to struggle energetically so that it will lead and guide the world revolution. Without proletarian ideology, there is no revolution. Without proletarian ideology, there is no hope for our class and the people. Without proletarian ideology, there is no communism. El Diario Speaking of ideology, why Gonzalo thought? Chairman Gonzalo Marxism has always taught us that the problem lies in the application of universal truth. Chairman Mao Zedong was extremely insistent on this point, that if Marxism, Leninism, Maoism is not applied to concrete reality, it is not possible to lead a revolution, not possible to transform the old order, destroy it, or create a new one. It is the application of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism to the Peruvian revolution that has produced Gonzalo Thought. Gonzalo Thought has been forged in the class struggle of our people, mainly the proletariat, 
in the incessant struggles of the peasantry, and in the larger framework of the world revolution, in the midst of these earth-shaking battles, applying as faithfully as possible the universal truths to the concrete conditions of our country. Previously, we called it the guiding thought. And if today the party, through its Congress, has sanctioned the term Gonzalo thought, it's because a leap has been made in the guiding thought through the development of the People's War. In sum, Gonzalo thought is none other than the application of Marxism-Leninism-Maoism to our concrete reality. This means that it is principle specifically for our party, for the People's War, and for the revolution in our country, and I want to emphasize that. But for us, looking at our ideology in universal terms, I emphasize once again, it is Maoism that is principle. El Diario What role is revisionism playing, and how does the PCP struggle against it? Chairman Gonzalo First, we should remember that every advance of Marxism has been made amidst fierce struggle. And in the process of development of Marxism, old-style revisionism emerged and met its downfall in World War I. But since then, we communists have confronted a new revisionism, modern revisionism, that began to develop with Khrushchev and his lackeys, and which is now unleashing a new offensive against Marxism. Its principal centers are the Soviet Union and China. Revisionism arose as a complete rejection of Marxism. Modern revisionism, likewise, is always aiming to substitute bourgeois philosophy for Marxist philosophy, going against political economy, particularly denying the growing impoverishment and the inevitability of the downfall of imperialism. Revisionism strives to falsify and twist scientific socialism in order to oppose the class struggle and revolution, peddling parliamentary cretinism and pacifism. All these positions have been expounded by the revisionists, who have aimed for and continue to aim for the restoration of capitalism, the undermining and blocking of the world revolution, and to denigrate the conquering spirit of our class. But here, I feel it is necessary to spell out some points to make this concrete. Revisionism behaves like any imperialism. For example, the Soviet Union, Soviet social imperialism, preaches and practices parliamentary cretinism. It mounts and conducts armed actions for the purpose of gathering world hegemony. It carries out aggression, pits one people against another, sets masses against masses, and divides our class and the people. In a thousand and one ways, Soviet revisionism fights against everything that is truly Marxist and everything that serves the revolution. We are an example of how they do this. The social imperialists of the USSR have developed a perverse worldwide plan to become a hegemonic superpower using all the means at their disposal. This includes setting up phony parties, communist in name only, quote, bourgeois worker parties, end quote, to use Engels' words. And this is how Chinese revisionism and all revisionists act, differing only with regard to their particular circumstances, according to who pulls their strings. Therefore, for us, the task is to fight revisionism and fight it relentlessly. We must keep in mind the lesson that we can't fight imperialism without combating revisionism. And our Congress has declared that we must wage a relentless and uncompromising struggle against imperialism, revisionism, and reaction worldwide. How should we carry out this struggle? In all spheres. The ideological, the economic, and the political. We must fight them in each one of these classic spheres. For if we should fail to carry out the struggle against revisionism, we wouldn't be communists. A communist has the obligation to combat revisionism, untiringly and implacably. And we have fought against revisionism. We fought against it since it first came on the scene. We were fortunate in this country to have been able to contribute by expelling them from the party in 1964, a fact they always try to hide. I want to make it very clear that the vast majority of the Communist Party united behind the banner of struggle against revisionism which Mao Zedong had unfurled, 
and they took aim at and struck blows against revisionism in the ranks of the Communist Party of that time, until they expelled Del Prado and his gang. From that time up to the present, we've continued fighting revisionism, not only here, but beyond our borders as well. We oppose it internationally. We oppose the Soviet social imperialism of Gorbachev, the Chinese revisionism of the perverse Deng Xiaoping, the Albanian revisionism of Ramiz Alia, follower of the revisionist Hoxha, just as we oppose all revisionists, whether they follow the line of the social imperialists, the Chinese or Albanian revisionists, or anyone else. El Diario Chairman, who is the main exponent of revisionism in Peru itself? Chairman Gonzalo, the so-called Peruvian Communist Party, the one that publishes, or published, Unity, the fifth column of Soviet revisionism, headed by the crusty revisionist Jorge del Prado, who some consider to be a, quote, time-honored revolutionary, end quote. Secondly, there's Patria Roja, an agent of Chinese revisionism whose party hacks worship Deng. El Diario Do you think that the influence of revisionism among the Peruvian masses creates an adverse situation for the revolution? Chairman Gonzalo If we keep in mind what Lenin taught us, and what Chairman Mao in turn emphasized and continued to develop, we see that revisionism is an agent of the bourgeoisie in the ranks of the proletariat, and so it provokes splits. It divides the communist movement and communist parties. It divides the trade union movement, and it breaks up and divides the people's movement. Revisionism obviously is a cancer, a cancer that has to be ruthlessly eliminated. Otherwise, we won't be able to advance the revolution. Remembering what Lenin said in a concise way, we must forge ahead on two questions. The question of revolutionary violence and the relentless struggle against opportunism, against revisionism. I believe that in our country, in considering the situation of the masses, we must see not only this question, but what Engels called the, quote, colossal pile of rubbish, end quote. He taught us that when a movement lasts for decades, like the movement of the proletariat, and even more so, the movement of the people, in our country, a great deal of rubbish piles up that needs to be swept away bit by bit. Our view is that this is something that has to be considered as well. How much can it influence the masses? Among the masses, what revisionism does is serve the cause of capitulation to internal reaction, concretely, to the big bourgeoisie and the landlords, to the landlord bureaucrat capitalist dictatorship, which is the Peruvian state of today. Internationally, it capitulates to imperialism and serves social imperialist hegemony or the desires for the same among certain powers evolving in that direction, like China. We believe that as the revolution and the people's war develop, as the class struggle sharpens, the people and the proletariat heighten their understanding more and more. And, at the same time, as they are forced to witness the betrayal of the revisionists and opportunists of all kinds on a daily basis, and as they see even more of this in the future, the proletariat and the people will have to carry out their mission of sweeping the revisionists out of all corners as best as they can. Unfortunately, as Engels has taught us, they can't be eliminated all at once, as they are part of the, quote, colossal pile of rubbish, end quote. El Diario Do you believe that revisionism is being decisively defeated in this country? Chairman Gonzalo To reiterate what the founders of Marxism have taught, to the extent that revisionism acts in concert with a reactionary state, the masses will come to understand its despicable role. As they see its actions, to the extent the people as a whole and the class see how they act, it's inevitable that they will more and more come to understand the pernicious role of the revisionists as traffickers, sellouts of the workers, opportunists and traitors. The revisionists are heading for their demise, and have been for some time now, not only because of the people's war, but rather this process began when revisionism was expelled from the ranks of the party, because at that point, another batch of serious communists began to come forward, and later became those who today, 
under the guidance of the Communist Party of Peru, are leading the People's War. And we think that the masses, with the class instincts of which Mariátegui spoke, will increasingly come to understand this, as they have already begun to do. Revisionism has already lost out. It's only a matter of time. The problem is already defined. The rubbish has begun... <clears throat> The rubbish has begun to be swept away, burned away. As I said, it's only a matter of time. The process of their demise began years ago. And if we go back further, to the beginnings, the ball game was lost when they became revisionists, when they abandoned their principles, at that point. What remained to be seen was how the class struggle would develop, and how a party like ours would be capable of carrying out its role, and how the masses would sustain it, support it, and carry it forward, how they would come to see that it is their party, that it defends their interests. And it is the masses themselves who will settle accounts, giving a just punishment to those who for decades have sold out and who continue to sell out the proletariat's basic interests, and they will also condemn and sanction those traitors who try to do so or begin to do so. El Diario what is your opinion of the new evangelism put forward by the Pope? Chairman Gonzalo Marx taught us that, quote, religion is the opiate of the people, end quote. This is a Marxist thesis which is completely valid today and in the future. Marx also held that religion is a social phenomenon that is the product of exploitation, and it will be eliminated as exploitation is swept away and a new society emerges. These are principles that we can't ignore, and that we must always keep in mind. Related to the previous point, it must be remembered that the people are religious, something which never has and never will prevent them from struggling for their basic class interests, and in this way serving the revolution, and in particular the people's war. I want to make it absolutely clear that we respect this religiousness as a question of freedom of religious beliefs, as recognized by the program which was approved by our Congress. So the question you asked really has to do, in our view, with the ecclesiastic hierarchy, with the papacy, that old theocracy that has succeeded in developing as a powerful instrument in Roman times. Later, adapting itself to the conditions of feudalism, it gained a vast power, even greater than before. But it always tried to rein in the struggle of the people, and defended the interests of the oppressors and exploiters, acting as an ideological shield for the reactionaries, changing and adapting itself as new situations emerged. We can see this clearly if we think about the relation between the church and the bourgeois revolution, the old bourgeois revolution. I'm referring to the French Revolution, for example. The church fiercely defended feudalism, and later, through a lot of struggle and after the defeat of feudalism, let me repeat, through great struggle, it adapted itself to the bourgeois order. It became once again an instrument at the service of the new exploiters and oppressors. In the present situation, what we see is a historical process which is unstoppable. The era of the world proletarian revolution, the new era begun in 1917, presents the problem for the proletariat of how to lead revolutions to change the old, decadent order and create a genuinely new society communism. In the face of this, how has the church responded? As in previous times, it seeks to survive, and this is the basis of the Vatican II Council, where the church sought to develop conditions that would permit it, first, to defend the old order, as it has always done, and then adjust and adapt itself in order to serve new exploiters, to continue to survive. This is what it seeks. This is the essence of Vatican II. The question of the, quote, new evangelism, end quote, refers explicitly to how ecclesiastical authority, the Pope in particular, sees the role of Latin America, where, as they themselves say, and the current Pope said in 1984, half the world's Catholics live. They are, consequently, trying to use the 500th anniversary of the discovery of America to push forward a so-called movement of, quote, new evangelism, end quote. In sum, this is what they hope for. Since evangelism officially began in 1494, 
following the discovery of America, with this new centennial, they want to develop a, quote, new evangelism, end quote, in defense of their bastion, this half of the, quote, parish, end quote, half of the bastion that sustains them in power. This is their goal. In this way, the hierarchy and the papacy aim to defend their position in America and serve U.S. imperialism, the dominant imperialist power in Latin America. But we have to understand this plan in the context of a campaign and a worldwide plan, linked to its relations with the Soviet Union on the occasion of the millennium of its Christianization, the ties with Chinese revisionism, the actions of the church in Poland, Ukraine, etc. It is a worldwide plan, and the quote, new evangelism, end quote, operates within it. As always, they are attempting to defend the existing social order, to be its ideological shield, because the ideology of reaction, of imperialism, has become decrepit. In the future, they will again seek to adapt in order to survive. But the prospects will be different, not like things were before. Marx's law will assert itself. Religion will wither away as exploitation and oppression are destroyed and eliminated. And since the papacy serves the exploiting class, and what will follow is not an exploiting class, the papacy will not be able to survive, and religion itself will wither away. In the meantime, the freedom of religious belief has to be recognized until mankind, advancing through new objective conditions, comes to possess a clear, scientific, and world-transforming consciousness. We must, therefore, analyze the, quote, new evangelism, end quote, in the context of this plan of the church to survive under new conditions, a transformation that they know must come. El Diario Chairman, according to what you've said, could we conclude, or would you say that the frequent visits of the Pope to our country have some relation to the People's War and the support the Pope is giving to the Garcia Perez regime? Chairman Gonzalo, I believe that is right. That's the way it is. In general, his visits to Latin America have to do with the importance of Latin America. And his visits to Peru have to do with how he called on us to lay down our arms while blessing the weapons of genocide as he did various times during his two visits to Peru. El Diario Now, Chairman, what will be the attitude of the PCP towards the religious theocracy when this party assumes state power? Chairman Gonzalo Marxism has taught us to separate church and state. This is the first thing we will do. Secondly, I want to repeat, we respect the freedom of religious belief of the people. Applying fully the principle of freedom to believe, as well as to not believe, to be an atheist. This is how we will handle it.